So welcome to uh, this talk, organized by the Philosophy Colloquium. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Manas Ray, uh, my coach friend from JNU. Uh, Manas's uh, work, it's difficult to kind of introduce his work. Many of you are familiar with his work. It stands at a kind of intersection of various disciplines. Uh, sociology, film studies, cultural studies, literary studies, political philosophy. I would say that the distinctive signature of Manas's uh, research and writing is a kind of preoccupation with what we can call zones of intensity of the everyday. And perhaps the best example of that is this very widely anthologized uh, long essay, Growing and Refugee. And this preoccupation often makes possible fresh conversations between philosophical and cultural texts and testimonies of the ordinary. And his recent research and teaching have engaged with the domain of the social regimes of biopolitics, questions of ethics, and processes of subjectivation. He has published a wide range of essays on continental political philosophy, critical legal theory, memory, and locality. Uh, we are all waiting for his uh, forthcoming book, which actually spans a range of these issues. It is titled Displaced, Lights on the Move. It is coming out of Primus Publishers in 2016. Manus, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, Manus edited two very important issues of the journal Studies in Humanities and Social Sciences. And more recently, the latest issue, that is this month's issue of seminars, uh, which addresses the state of democracy, has been edited by Manas. So his current preoccupation with democracy is evident in the talk today, which is titled Democracy, Values of the People. So after Manas' talk, we can also have a lively discussion on the things. Thank you, Uday. Uh, as usual, very kind. Uh, and some of the things he said about some of my writings will make me go back to those and read again to find new meaning out of it. Thanks, Uday. So, I know excuse is not a good way of introduction, but today I must say I'm yet to recover from a bout of fever and headache and cough and all that. Happen. and also about to recover from the medicines I do. Okay, all right. So what I'll do, basically I'll stick to these few pages that I have. Uh, bear with me, I'll try to be as less boring as possible. But the reason why I, you know, as Uday said, I basically, if you put Uday what he said to, ex to sort of explain what I do, is I write about whatever suddenly comes to mind. You know, it could be in continental philosophy, it could be memory or whatever. The reason why I thought of writing a paper on this is, you know, why I ask myself, why is it, how come, even though democratic states are sort of engulfed in more and more violence, even though there are thousand and one sort of complaints against democratic states. Why are people asking for more democracy and not less democracy? What's the paradox? So this is a tentative way of addressing the paradox, you know, some of it. So let me begin by saying, we live in the midst of violence. Its stresses are everywhere in modern democratic states. Rarely there is a day when the front pages of the morning newspaper does not carry the picture of a body smeared in blood. As a matter of fact, reading newspaper these days has also become a training in brutalization. If violence is omnipresent, if social solidarity is shattered all too often by its eruptive presence, 
The question to ask is how come, through what magic, the state as a political formation is surviving in the first place. <coughs> Despite all the uncertainties and the glaring fault lines, it somehow seems to function and manage to retain even if a tattered unity. What makes democratic order so durable in spite of its myriad loopholes and thousand histories of disappointment? The curious fact is, the more democratic states are under the sway of violence, the more resolute people seem in their demand for more democracy. This is a great paradox of contemporary life. To understand and unveil this apparent contradiction is the purpose of this paper for which I invite you to take a fresh look at the fundamentals of political democracy. Amartya Sen has characterized the rise of democracy as a preeminent event of the 20th century, a century which otherwise was witness to two huge communist revolutions, among many other such developments. It is during this century that democracy as a mode of political rule became, to paraphrase him, a default case that is considered right unless the claim is somehow precisely Perhaps one of the reasons for this preeminence is that democracy offers a powerful weapon to both the rulers and the ruler. Democracy encourages people to make their demands to the rulers and if not granted, to go for greater struggles. And the more people are engaged in the fight for democratic rights, the more they are incorporated within the forms of democratic governance. Perhaps the greatest riddle of democracy lies in the expression, the people. It is democracy's raison d'etre, the source of its dynamism and moral standing, and its ever elusive. A scene from Calcutta shortly after the partition, apparently one Oshin Babu of the account section of the Central Calcutta College used to come out to the long steps in front of the college building during recess hour and yell in his East Bengal dialect, a voice laden with despair, Zonagon so keki dakona kisulzi, meaning Zonagon, can't you see what's happening in front of your eyes? And everyone who told me about this man reasserted that they are not making it up. Actually, there was one who used to do this every time. So I get very suspicious about his existence. But anyway, this is a symptom that I am talking about. His voice floated <coughs> nakedly and was lost in the teeming footfalls of the Calcutta afternoon's thoroughfare. Janagon never answered. We all, each one of us, are the people, yet no one is. If the singular, the real life flesh and blood human indicates to the finitude of the concept, then we, as collectivity points towards its infinity. In other words, only by bringing finitude and infinitude at one place can one understand the people. Because of this magical mix, the people is the ever receding point of democracy. The more we try to locate it, pin it down, the more it recedes from us. This placement of democracy at the interface of finitude and infinitude is what gives modern democracy, its, a modern secular democracy, its sacredness. The modern sacred, if we, uh, we can say, which is at once imminent and transcendent. Because of this infinity again, democratic profiling of the people cannot be restricted just to the citizens. Conceptually, the idea of the citizen must carry within itself a bridge to humanity at large, the ontological human where particularities are destined to meet. A move that does not reduce the importance of particularities, rather it gives it a needed, hallowed ethical presence by placing it on the trajectory of the universal humanity. Man and citizen are not designation of collectivities, as we know, but political subjects. As such, they are accompanied by dispute right from the beginning. Rights of man refer to those who have no property left other than the property of their bodies. The right not to be perished, 
in itself rights of man means nothing or having or having rights on natality claim means nothing it is just a gesture of theological remnants so called inalienable rights but in relation to rights of citizen it questions the rights of those who have those rights it questions the division of having effective rights and having no rights or only formal rights the very way the declaration was framed gave rise to a series of claims like the rights of the women of workers of the colonized races to be incorporated into citizenship which were not in keeping with the natural rights tradition but this is the other theater at the same time revolutionary france dispatched army to quell black insurgency in saint domingue haiti to give just one example this twin theater will ultimately target the frame which decides what is given and what is not this is the apparatic uh, character that bolivar refers to in the founding text of french revolution it will be it will be the aim of liberal rule to tame this apparatic character implanted into liberal technology of rule liberty equality and fraternity instead of being a revolutionary outcry outcry has become a consensual regulatory ideal where they no more represent themselves in the singular claims of each but lend themselves into one another to form an amorphous composite whose primary function is to signify a civilized nation state in contrast to the colonies what sort of parallax does it inaugurate between transcendence and immanence between the rights of man inalienable and universal but in practice the rights of those who are rightless and the rights of citizen positive and instituted and standing for freedom and equality but in effect the rights of the few does this split also bring about a split in the practice of democracy itself between a properly constituted democracy that is amenable to rational discourse and recognized by the constitution a law abiding democracy we can say and a populist irrational opportunistic practices in the name of historical injustice and electoral advantage we will take up this point later on but let me carry on with this concept of the people for some more time in all this the category the people <coughs> remains baffling because it is at once the name of the political body and also name of those who have no effective power this is what gives its occasional explosive power the people is a supplementary supplementarity it has all it has nothing the name of ceaseless elaboration man equal to citizen is the sign of the infinite politicization of rights claim and therefore bolivar at one point says that man equal to citizen is not so much the definition of a political right as the affirmation of a universal right to politics the very difference between man and citizen is not a sign of disjunction therefore proving that the rights are either void or tautological rather this space is open to political mobilization of staking claims the birth of political subjects it is the opening of an interval for political subjectivization karl schmidt german legal philosopher of early 20th century of some notoriety and belated recognition and a few others in more recent times have discussed the constitutive influence of theology in the formation of modern secular democratic nation states in democracy the people as a source of legitimation and driving force is clearly defined one can never approximate the people neither it will ever quit the scene like in kurur call a particular trope you know that uh, the bengali nonsense rhymer and uh, artist shukumar ray is the father of satyajit ray you know he had this 
in his one of his, to illustrate one of his nonsense rhyme called Kuro Paul, Paul meaning the device, you know. And Kuro is the uncle, you know, uncle's device. He showed this man carrying a long stick and at the end of the stick something that he wants, you know, some fruit or whatever is hanging. And the more he walks to catch it, the more he walks. This is, this is it. Like in Kurur Kol of the Bengali nonsense rhymer and artist Shukumar Ray, it will always dangle at the distance in front of you, lure you, and dangling, it will move as you cross miles enchanted by it. The people in democracy and God in theocratic states have very similar architectonics and location. Interestingly, in capital self-definition, it too is an ever-widening grid, G-R-I-D, grid that no one can own. Novelist Sunil Ganguly once commented that God is the sweetest and cruelest rumor of human societies. In line with our analogy of Kurur Kaul, we can say that he must also be the most productive rumor. For to keep him happy, the kind of labor that humans will perform and the extent to which they will go is truly amazing and we have examples of it all around us. To carry on with the tropes of God and the people, like practiced magicians, politicians play all kinds of bunny and hat games with the latter. The history of democracy is in a way the history of humankind's been made a fool at the altar of the people. The theological homology of secular democracies can amply be discussed, has amply been discussed. I would, however, suggest that what is more interesting is the opposite argument. That is how, in spite of its massive defeat load, democracies can resist defeat over determination. How they manage to retain a measure of difference from the theological state, that is. According to Peter Fitzpatrick, the well-known legal philosopher, and I'm quoting him, the defix substitutes a critical of modernity, but modernity is in ways critical of and incompatible with them. Unquote. As he sees it, sovereignty's self-generating supremacy crucially depends on a responsive incorporation and assimilation of the multitude of disparate forces that continually come to constitute and reconstitute it. This is sovereignty's incipient vacuity. The idea holds interesting, uh, interesting parallels with classically Rousseau's idea of the plenitude of collective presence needing an empty center, the impossible, impossible to occupy. Incidentally, Fitzpatrick holds Rousseau as a notorious presence in the pantheon of secular theologic apostles. The significance of this line of analysis is that it indicates that the politics of protest and rebellion only enriches democratic rule, even in a skewed way it is. In incorporating and assimilating them, sovereignty gains its comprehensiveness and dynamism. In other words, the insurrectional mode the ever-renewed act of revolt, critique, and subversion in part is part of the democratic apparatus. It ideally gathers its energy from those acts. Democracy's etymology, demo plus crazy, Kratos as you said, indi uh, crazy indicating force and violent incorporation, gestures to a necessary insurrection. The suffix krese has another meaning though in Greek. It means healing. So <coughs> it means healing that actually completes the understanding of modern democracy. At once violent incorporation and the promise of healing. I go to the next section, I call it democracy, the durable poser. Understandably, modern democratic states have two sides to them. First is the world of strategies marked by ceaseless attempts to retain hegemony over myriad social relations, strifes, and tensions. 
just now, as I said, incorporating the multitude of challenges. Here, Michel Foucault's notion of governmentality comes to effect, i.e. the coming together of practices of the state in the form of local and targeted interventions with new regimes of knowledge. And second, guiding such down-to-earth interventions is a kind of transcendence where the state is supremely the bearer of human rights of which the primary right is the right to life, translated mostly in our part of the world as the life, right to livelihood. This is the moral life of the state. In upholding this right, the state is the will of the people. Because of these two streams, the citizens are at once subject to the state's pedagogy and are also supreme. As Rancière points out, worried theorist Plato onwards saw in the people the sign of sheer arbitrariness, the unrest unrestricted freedom of individuals to act as they like, without concern for common discipline. For Plato, democracy is the overturning of natural relations. The fathers obey the sons, the elders imitate the young, women and slaves are as free as men and masters. In spite of this, we would like to maintain if the larger part of the world goes for democracy, it is because in democracy people can be made to live, work and cohere more productively. Democratic rule's biggest challenge is a ground level democratic search. It has to constantly devise strategies to incorporate this excess that it itself throws up and without which democratic rule loses its inventiveness and more importantly, its legitimacy. Therefore, democracy can ill afford to be a field of ontologies which as a matter of fact are better seen as rhetorical openings to different positionalities and interventions. If we believe in what the French political historian Pierre Rosamello has to say, then the answer to democracy's durability lies in its unceasing zest to pose as an experiment. Democracy observes Rosamello in his book, Democracy Past and Future, rarely solves anything, but makes solution problematic and drives its energy in this very gesture of making issues problematic. It is, this, it is its power of indeterminacy and flexibility through which it manages its citizens. If democracy seems an unsurpassable horizon of political formations, even after 200 years of the French Revolution, the reason Ronsomello says lies here. The way it is framed in European theorizing, bringing together disenchantment and indeterminacy, democracy by definition carries a strain of secularism. Mind you, this is the European theater I'm talking about. Only liberal secularism can make democracy possible. Looking closely, however, the romantic pose, pose of uncertainty comes with a huge certainty. The certainty of its supremacy as a system of organizing society. The certainty that every other mode is inferior. The certainty that makes going to war overseas and establishing democracy in traditional societies not only not considered wrong, but from a progressive standpoint, unavoidable. To cut a long story short, Western democracy, religious disenchantment, modernity, universal reason, progress, capitalism, and the people, they all have coeval births. They all are part of the same discursive matrix. If you don't follow all, you cannot truly belong to any. If democracy is both the highest value and the best possible means to solve problems, then it can hardly escape a wholly, a wholly altruistic character, an ever-repetitive reality, born a thousand times 
only to die in each case of its own weight. Such is its enchanting captivity that once inside the spiral of democracy, one can only make complaints about democracy to the court of democracy. This is democracy's no exit wizardry that defines the political lives of the West, its hopes, and in a way, the miseries it foists on the rest of the world. Like, take for instance, after 9-11, when there was a televisual trial of the world, everyone was brought in you know, as witness, except those who were suspected of terrorism. Because the logic given is that these people don't believe in democratic logic. So they cannot be brought you know, for trial because that's all about democracy. So in order to be judged democratically, you have to first subscribe to democracy. So this is the understanding. Uh, is, uh, if it is switched off, do you think it will be, will be, will be feeling yeah. off? Just try and let's see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, go, when I move to the next uh, for section called Groundless Ground, Secret of Democracy's Insidious Power. If, democ if democracy is ruled by consent, who effectively rules that? The very ground of the power of ruling, says Rancien, is that no ground exists. Legitimacy for political governance is not along the lines of seniority, fatherhood, science, strength, at all, or what he calls borrowing the Greek word, the arche of ruling. The power of demos is the power of those for whom no arche entitles to exercise it. Hence, democratic rule <coughs> is Hence, democratic rule here is all the more insidious because there is not one predefined definite ground. It is the rule of the people who have no greater qualification for ruling than for being ruled. Therefore, we would argue democratic rule necessarily takes the form of a modern day pastoralism, technology of care to absorb the needs and heightened expectations of the people, along with it, if required, incarceration or even termination in the name of security. For democracy to pave a way out of this, of its solipsism, as I was talking of, that in democracy, in democ you have to belong to that spiral of democracy, you know. So to, uh, to pave a way out of its solipsism, its extreme preoccupation with itself, it must open up to its otherness and impossible inclusion that marks the horizon of democracy to come. Derrida's is not a feasibility agenda, otherwise we could have explained his position as what democracy cannot incorporate but must always try to, thus ever stretching the limits of the possible. Democracy is haunted by the other. Its symptom is, this symptom is constituted. If liberal democracy is, as emergent by Margaret Canavan, a garden in the midst of a jungle, then it effectively lives in the threshold, always anticipating encroachment and attack. Do not say the political in democracy lies in the displacement of settled limits by the eruptive excess which enacts the equality of anybody with everybody else. We would, however, like to maintain that political is the interface of recalcitrance of the population and the governmental interventions to assimilate it by extending the bounds of the legal. For it is here, in this fuzzy zone, that the social is extended and negotiated by contested creation of new meanings. Democracy's ethical claim lies in, on no better ground than an appeal to ethics itself. Singularly, an individual can be corrupt, but the people as a collectivity can never be said to be so. 
while it is in while it is individual lives that in the last analysis count it is collectivity that gives democracy its species character ballot box as a principal instrument of parliamentary democracy is a symbol of democracy's legitimacy magically to go by the logic of democracy which places its main significance in safeguarding the rights of minorities electoral representation ought to uphold the ethical promise far beyond the number game the victorious candidate is not only the representative of a party and those who have voted for her but for the entire electorate even if the win is at a 59 49 51 49 merger the one who wins is equal representative of all this is not so much a technical or tactical qualification question of which sections of the electorate to woo so that win is ensured in the next hasting but fundamentally an ethical position without which democratic representation falls meaningless this is the ethical skill of modern electoral democracy come how, however you might have won you represent and should be fair to the entirety of your electorate this is the minimum to ensure a principal democracy and this is what is very often violated to remain true to this symbolic value of representation people i mean real life people must be on the alert therefore right from the beginning of parliamentary democracy a number of checks and balances and ways of applying the brakes have been devised voting attributes to democracy juridical legitimacy but this cannot be an entire assurance for the life of democracy along with juridical legitimation there is a mobilization of trust to counter the erosion of confidence in the democratic process this is a, com a complex assortment of practical measures along with the informal as well as institutional social counterpowers to challenge and combat the trust deficit of a functioning democracy rosa vallo calls this process organizing distrust it comes from the understanding that regimes based on general will can go astray it makes sure that elected officials keep their promises and find ways to maintain pressure on the government to serve the common good its common measures are powers of oversight that is vigilance forms of prevention and testing of judgments calling this counter democracy rosavelo explains it in the following way and i quote him by counter democracy i mean not the opposite of democracy but rather a form of democracy that reinforces the usual electoral democracy a kind of buttress a democracy of indirect powers disseminated throughout society in other words a durable democracy of distrust which complements the episodic democracy of usual electoral representative system this counter democracy is part of a larger system that also includes electoral illegal democratic institutions on whole in indian politics aam aadmi party is the first major political party that has been based on the promise of what rosavelo characterized as counter democracy i'm talking of the time it actually went for the uh, for elections the democracy of vigilance this is also remarkable how people across class and social div divides voted it to power but by and large people vote not so much for issues of the candidate one votes for one's own party which stands for a set of interests and gives the voter an identity michigan paradigm a study conducted nearly 30 years back clearly showed that voters choose not on basis of their political knowledge which is minimal but rather of partisan identities that they acquire very early in life quite often the allegiance to one 
particular party becomes a matter of block voting. After the last Lok Sabha election, a, vis a victorious candidate from Maharashtra was seen to be walking around his constituency wearing a shirt made of gold and having three gun-totting men as his escorts. <laughs> Once the picture became public, there was some controversy. But the MP was undeterred, as were his supporters. Surely, if there were a fresh election around that time, he would have been again victorious. For his voters, he is the sign of historical injustice committed against them and also the means of achieving positive discrimination in present times and setting the scores right. Surely it is not he, but what he represents for them that would count for his voters. His personal practices would be seen as nodes in a symbolic contest of history. Drawing clues from the above discussion, it can be said that at the moment we are witnessing two opposed trends in Indian democracy. One is of block voting and the other of surveillance. I want to enlist two other related trends along with them, that of supra-democracy and what I call counter-democracy. As categories they are flexible and one can take the place of other very easily. Nonetheless, there is a conceptual difference between the two. Here, let me clear, I am using the term differently, terms differently from Rosalind. Supra-democracy, in the way I am using it, is both the people's disillusionment and lack of trust in the prevalent mode of governance. What, Raz what Rosalind has called counter-democracy in his book is, in our consideration, supra-democracy because surveillance is its main plan. What I am calling counter-democracy, on the other hand, is a product of powerlessness and marginalization of a large section of the populace. It, if it is affected by attacking the institutions and protocols of democracy itself. Usually the supporters of these movements come from the underdogs of the city. As examples, we can cite those who participated in the movement to oust Taslima Nasrin from Calcutta of those who vandalized the paintings of M.F. Hussain in Mumbai. And recent times, such examples are multiplied like nobody's business. Here, the issue is of staking claim not only to the city, but over the city by those who have been traditionally kept outside the effective goals of politics. Now I come to the last section called People, Popular, Populism. In a democracy, people make a plurality of demands. When the demands are specific and are dealt with separately, it remains within the proper fold of democracy. But when demands are uh, neglected persistently, Multiple frustrations trigger social logics of an entirely different kind. These demands then, argues Laclau, form a composite through equivalential logic. The subject of such composite equivalential demands he calls populist. There is a sense in Laclau that in modern day democracy, only populism is pro-people, addressing as it does the needs of the underdog. When demands are in separate fragments, it is easier for the state to take a clientelistic approach. Populism alone offers the sense of the people through aggregation, where horizontal, synchronic demands become vertically integrated into a popular will. For Laclau, the grand example of populism through the logic of equivalence is a Solidarność movement, a political whirlpool of sorts that rapidly converted the demands of a particular working group in dance into the signifiers of multiple frustrations and grievances of ordinary Polish people. In contemporary Indian history, 
the Shingu Nondikra movement can serve as a parallel example. There, the popular protests of peasants against forceful eviction from land soon transform into a mega text for the cumulative grievances of rural population against the long rule of the left front. Populism also needs the first rank of an enemy responsible for all the miseries of the people, it would be assumed. For Bengal, at that point of time, it was the CPIM, its leaders, and the kings. To Laklau, more than the contents of the demands articulated, it is the prevalence of equivalential over differential logic that demarcates the movement as populist as against democracy. However, he admits that quite often the actual social demands are repressed by violent imposition of the dominant equivalential discourse. This, in a way, is an admission that there is clearly an anti-people element in populism. Its ad hoc approach to problems and mode of dispensing immediate gratification does the people harm in real terms. Regardless, Lakla will maintain that only populism attributes the underdog, the agency of history, something not possible through procedural democratic means. And this <coughs> is something that, as you know, in our country, Partha Chatterjee has very openly supported. Here a disclaimer is in place. By underdog as history's agent, he does not proclaim the unmediated universality of the proletariat. The secret of whose existence is the dissolution of either two world order. Proletariat in Marxist literature is a negative sign, a charged emptiness vowed to recast history. What Laclau means by history's agency is the ability to make the ruling class meet the demands of the underdog in very concrete terms. Questioning the institutional order of liberal democracy, he is, and I quote Laclau, an agent which is an other in relation to the way things stand, unquote. Since the logic of equivalence is also at the heart of the principle of representation, Laclau will claim a generic similarity between populism and the people as a construct. And just, I have a small little quote from there. The representative matrix out of which the people emerges, a certain particularity which assumes a function of universal representation, the distortion of the identity of particularity through the constitution of equivalent chains, the popular camp resulting from these substitutions presenting itself as representing society as a whole. But is Laclau correct to claim equivalential logic as the fundamental trait of populism? Not at least if one goes by the contemporary history of political mobilization in India, where more than a variety of groups coming together with a smorgasbord of demands and complaints and forming a complex of people's demands, what is prevalent or increasingly becoming prevalent is the indulgence of the ruling parties in populist measures. To cite certain instances from today's West Bengal under TMC government, distributing cycles among rural school-going children, introducing salary of local imams, doling out money to ground level party cadres in the name of giving grants to local clubs, many of which come into being only at the time of receiving the money. Here, more than responding to unattended people's demands, these demands are formed only in the process of announcement of awards. Mamta Banerjee, who came to power in 2011, riding the crest of an exceptionally successful anti-eviction campaign by her party, made it her official policy to disallow government role in land acquirement for commercial or any other purposes. 
thus making procurement of land de facto impossible in a state where land is highly fragmented. Consequently, investment and job creation have taken a sharp jolt. Banerjee does not have the good fortune of having an identifiable enemy who can be held responsible for state's miseries. Banging the left does not yield much today, four years after its resounding defeat. Threatened by the prospect of exposure of Sharada scam and geared by the hope of a friendly government at the center during the conduct of next assembly election, she cannot afford to antagonize the BJP beyond the point. For her, the only way out is to appease the people by continuing with a slew of ad hoc populist measures to different sections of the population. In the absence of a, pop, of a powerful opposition, <coughs> which is an onerous task given the credibility deficit of the left and the ongoing coercion, ordinary people become used to restricting their hopes to occasional gratis in the scenario of internecine strife and poverty. A distinction between popular and populist demands is perhaps in order here. <coughs> Kejriwals it up swept the assembly polls not by promising money to the voters or money to the local clubs for entertainment, by, but by promising better municipal schools, cleaner and registered slums, and better health care for the poor. If the local poor agitate for a cluster of demands, better street lighting, more drinking water, repair of roads, and police action against criminal elements, merely the equivalential character of demands does not make the agitation populist. Regardless of the logic of equivalence, it should qualify as a popular movement because they address the genuine needs of the people. The poor in India, be it in urban slums or in the dusty villages, are the main voters of modernity. This is the prime effect of India's democracy. They fight for their rights, primarily the right to livelihood, which the politicians try to give a populist angle for their partisan benefits. Passive revolution and the conditions of electoral democracy make sure there is a transfer of resource from corporate accumulation economy to the livelihood needs of India's burgeoning poor, many of whom have been left landless and jobless due to the operations of primitive accumulation. These people, only formerly citizens, live outside the effective reach of civil society. This is the section of population that political theorist Partha Chatterjee calls political society. The concept owes its life to democracy, which assures everyone a vote and thus translates it um, its legal social marginality into a potent political factor. The section that is hurt most by rampant corruption is, of course, the poor. But its own livelihood, ironically, quite often lies in fuzzy legal zones. This is not, however, corruption for great, like the cops who extol haptas from these people, but corruption for sheer existence. Political society says strategy operates as a community, but it is contingently constructed community. Its main purpose is to negotiate with governmental agencies its moral right to livelihood from its location of fuzzy legality. From the side of the government, the thrust is to provide biopolitical security to the economic underdogs. The deep penetration of governmental technology has made sure that these people rely less on local fixers or are no more caught in the patron-client relationship with the powerful. Following this line of analysis, it can be said that there are clearly two registers of Indian, India's democracy today. If electoral mobilization gives political society its life, then bureaucratic managerial class, print and visual media and the judiciary provides civil society its club. It is through these people and these channels that corporate capital exerts its sway on the Indian state. Whether this two-pronged pattern will work for long 
and to what extent of neatness is a matter of speculation. Here a caveat needs to be added about the continued use of expression primitive accumulation. Classically resettlement was not an agenda for primitive accumulation. In India throughout the British rule and even in the first three decades of independence this too was the case. But in recent years land prices in India have skyrocketed and is now the highest in the world. As Shanjai Chakraborty argues in this issue of <coughs> seminar that Uday mentioned, if land were there to be, uh, to be taken, if land were to be taken in Shingu after the rights to fair compensation and transparency in land acquisition, rehabilitation and resettlement act, after that act was enforced, 2030, what was 10 lakhs per acre in 2007 will now effectively cost 85 lakhs. This exceedingly high price has invited a nexus of politicians and local real estate mafia, or what is called in newspaper and social media the syndicate branch. Such turn of events is likely to recast the corporate capital political society equation in the coming years. A notion is increasingly gaining strength with its contemporary lineage going, to, going back to Club of Rome that's limits to growth in the 1970s, that given the levels of technology and also the propensity to produce more value-added commodities which fetch more profit in spite of their very high price, at least one third of world's population is becoming redundant either as labor or mafia. This means a fortified accumulation economy along with a huge hinterland of need economy. Binding the two spheres is the new industrial commercial public sphere, which unlike the classical <coughs> public sphere, exploits the lived experience of everyday life as its raw material and provides an ill real tapestry of dream fulfillment that these days quite often run, uh, run in the lines of flesh hunt. This could also mean a democratic rule of arbitrary care and termination. Termination and ceaseless production of dead treaties. It is becoming the face of our post-colonial neoliberal democracy. The day Lal Mohan Tudu, the Maoist leader from Midnapur, was shot in his eyes and killed, the same police force who killed him made sure that his daughter was escorted to the local Ramakrishna Mission School for her Madhyamik exams. Mike Davis in his book Planet of Slums calls this production of detritus surplus humanity, which he initiates as a critique of neoliberal economy, but also as a statement of fact. But the Chatterjee's uh, example of how the inhabitants of rail line Basti managed to make paralegal arrangement with the state, people whose very habitation or livelihood lied on the other side of legality is very well known. But the one example of his in that book, Politics of the World, that is seldom cited is the study of coal miners of Raniganj who showed little interest or no interest in a rehabilitation project, even though they lived dangerously with fire breaking out anytime, anywhere in their living surroundings. <coughs> Used to living on the brink of death, zest for life has left them. They are the living dead of Indian democracy. Thank you. Reflections on democracy and the category which is central to the idea of democracy that is the people. Now, uh, Manus made uh, through a series of uh, somebody's cell phone. 
and a series of increasingly complex reflections. He teased out some of the paradoxes sent into that category. So I just want to linger on that for a moment before we open it up for discussion. Uh, there is something uh, peculiar about this category of the people because we know that it stands somewhere between the idea of uh, a citizen view on the one hand and the idea of a population on the other. Uh, and the people functions both as a kind of uh, empirical descriptive category of uncertain coverage and at the same time it is also a kind of uh, ground which is invoked, it's an object of invocation in political projects all the time. And I felt that Manas was uh, very good at teasing out this complexity of the category of the people. There is something virtual about this category and its actualization seemed to push it either in the direction of systems of surveillance as he called it on the one hand and governmentality, the tactics and strategies of governmentality on the other. Now, we know that the relationship between the category of the people and of the idea of democracy is fundamental. We know that uh, democracy conceives the people as a site of sovereignty. But at the same time, democracy also is understood as a form of governance of which the object is characterized as a people. So in that sense, the people appears both as the ruler as well as the ruled in a kind of uncertain oscillation. And I, I wondered when I was listening to Manas, what would be the contemporary salience of these reflections on democracy? Manas began by characterizing it as living in an era where we think of democracy as the unsurpassable horizon of governance for political arrangements. But interestingly, the analysis, to the analysis, he pushed this thinking to a point where he ended with speculations on the production of the living dead as the condition of democracy in our times. Now, I think that combination, that trajectory, which on the one hand claims democracy to be the unsurpassable horizon of political imagination in our times. And on the other hand, as the ground of the production of the living dead, that as the inevitable consequence of democracy in our times is certainly worth pondering on the examining. So I wondered where, where the people would figure in this last scene on which Manas let down the curtain of his talk. Do the people appear as uh, that which is available in democratic calculations anymore? Or is the place of visibility of the people to be found in that which does not get counted, that which cannot be counted, that which appears only in the form of the living dead or in the paradoxical combination of the dead uh, body and the daughter being accompanied to the school in that kind of combination. So where do we actually see the visibilization of this category of the people in our times? Because the people is invoked all the time as uh, the, the uh, fundamental vocabulary for democracy. But at the same time, it is increasingly a point which is receding from the horizon. So this, I think, is one of the very instructive observations that Manas uh, has presented before us to think about. So we can take up, I'm sure that there will be other perspectives on the paper, but we can take up some questions and then start with that. Yes, can I pass the mic? Uh, yeah, you have it. Sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sir, I went along with your theoretical discussion and thought it was very, really, very carefully based, and I would agree with you. But on the other hand, my problem lies in the fact that you stop at where you think that the working class is amenable to corruption. I think Shri Vishnath and Harsetti also take the same point. I do not quite agree. So 
in some senses, this idea that corruption is validated by poverty is not uh, an argument that I would take in constitutional terms. I've always made it very clear. I think we're in a dangerous uh, moment where the question of this validation has allowed for the appearance of people like Swami Akhtenai. So the very questions of how we look at Gorakhpur or how we look at the socialization of large numbers of individuals, we call them working class, we may say proletariat is a name, but on the other hand, the question of the shift of the proletariat from Marxist orientations to RSS orientations is so dramatic that the numbers are evident and available for us to read. But the real question is the fanning out of the working class all over India and the spaces which a particular kind of tantric Hinduism represented in terms of the validation of uh, Hashi, Ganja, uh, free sex, rape, murder, all of these are oriented in terms of its presence in, in, in our parliament. So I think we really have to you know, jump to a new space where the questions of discordance is then we were not from the perspective of uh, bourgeois intellectuals, which indeed we are, to the real questions of how you pose a problem for us, theoretically, and the questions that we well know from the value of society. But let me congratulate you for one thing. Thank you very much. You see, uh, uh, Susan, when I was talking about corruption, the point that I was making is that people, the section that gets you know, most affected Worsely affected by 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 uh, by uh, corruption uh, are the poor. You know, I didn't mention the word working class, but nonetheless, their lives at many levels are sort of compromised in that bureaucratic corruption. They have, like, you know, someone comes to the city and has to do something for livelihood, maybe drives a three-wheeler for which it doesn't have the permit. You know? So that sort of thing. So that's what I was referring to, you know. And the fact I said that when AAP made this promise of clean administration, it was the poor people who voted in large numbers shows basically they want to come out of this corruption. Otherwise, you know, a, a kind of necessary corruption without which they cannot have their livelihood. So that is the point I was making. I was not equating working class with corruption by no means. The other thing is, yeah. yes. There is a, a space where the shutters have come down and there is a new space of responsibility. Actually, this space I was trying to address. You see, the reason why I didn't use the phrase working class is not that working class has withered from India, but as a conceptual category, as an analytical category. As you yourself said, what happens when working class moves from the left to RSS and this kind of other sorts of vandalisms that we are seeing that they are participating. Maybe we need a different uh, kind of analysis, you know, a different kind of understanding of city's demography. demography. And therefore I brought in Mike Davis at the end, Planet of Slums, where he's trying to show where, why is it happening? Well, that's some telephone. Yeah. It's it's the mobile phone. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All the mobile phones are associated. Yeah. yeah. So what is happening there, as Mike Davis is saying, in fact, he raises the question of, as you know, Mike Davis as a Marxist left kind of left-wing background, but still he tries to suggest whether this class analysis will work with them, not that it will, not that it is redundant, but as an immediate analytical kind of procedure whether we go by that. In the sense, the city's demography, where half the city, you know, is not involved in any productive, accumulative capital, you know, uh, uh, production, but in some other kinds of, as it is now called, need economy, uh, or you know, without any job, just a kind of uh, vagabond army, where what kind of, you know, face, social and cultural face with the city show up. And as you say, and as I also mentioned, you know, uh, all these other things that are happening, rape, murder, and that gruesome level of murder, which is one indicator of our social life.
for such round. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your lecture, sir. Uh, I was trying to read your article in seminar. Uh, sir, uh, really I could not get that uh, who are the people constituted in a democracy. Actually, you totally negate the idea of social in your piece, in your talk also. How do you locate the idea of social? That is very much embedded in a democracy. And if I would uh, interpret it that, that way, that how do you place the Brahminism in the democracy? It is not just the working class or not just the class academy that one can understand, but it is also very much epistemic violence. How do you define rape? Right? How do you define uh, the atrocities? It is very much interesting. So, while this is the one thing that I, I didn't find in your whole piece that I read also. This is one. And second thing is that while analysis, de analysis democracy, we have to understand that how democracy also interpret and exercise in terms of the rights. It is the social group who has the privilege of both capital as well as the social capital, who actually exercise democracy in their way. Sir, you see, if social is a force field of relationships, that is, that is throughout present. Yes, you are right. I didn't go into analysis of any historical juncture, of any historical, concrete historical analysis. If that is what you are meaning by saying that social is absent from my paper, then yes. But that wasn't the aim of this paper. This is more or less a kind of conceptual theoretical paper. But it is actually informed by this whole idea of a force field of, as I said, a multitude of challenges, you know, multitude of forces, and how to incorporate that, you know, that is the, that is the thrust of that paper and how it cannot be incorporated. As I said at one point, Democracy's greatest challenge is democracy itself, because democracy has two different meanings. One is when you go by the demos part, that is, that excess of demand, ever excessive demands. The other is how to convert that energy into a new form of rule. Okay? And these two are always in tango. And that is what I was trying to place. And by the people, as you said, as Uday also mentioned, it's the very unlocalizability. At the same time, its very existence at every point of time. This is what I was, again, this ambiguity I was trying to address. Thank you. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, I have inflated violence as a category for ourselves. Uh, is it yeah, like the way we have Inflated violence as a category for us, as violence as a term, the way it has grown a lot. Is it at all possible to look for non-violence now as a value in democracy? And that's where my interest also lies. And last week, you know, I gave a talk on, on non-violence here at JNU itself. You see, one, I wouldn't say that violence has inflated. You know, that would, you know, make the earlier, you know, times more violent, more peaceful, I mean, sorry, less violent, more peaceful. Let's look at it in terms of the power dynamics. Let's say that the prominent strategies of pacification are not working all that well. And why they are not, for, to understand why they are not working all that well, we have to look at the ground level reality, the new arrangement of forces, the new alignment of forces, you know, the new sort of arrangement of resources. Okay? We start from there. So that's a concrete analysis. The second point whether nonviolence has a role to play, I say I think yes. It is only nonviolence that has a role to play, and that would be a kind of to borrow his work, a change of existence. Because, you see, my interest, as I said at the beginning of that lecture where you know, Professor Susan Vishwanathan was there, I said that why this, I was not so much, to share a kind of biographical truth with you, not so much interested in this whole aspect you know, of nonviolence. 
But last year when I saw on television very closely the last kind of encounter, big encounter last summer uh, of Israel Palestine, which basically means you know bombarding of Palestine. I realized that no matter how much wrong the Palestinians are, you know, violence won't solve the problem of Palestine. We have to have a non-violent resistance to that. And the duty, the onus lies not only on the Palestinians, but on for all of us. But having said that, let me add a last sentence to it. I don't think non-violence is merely the other of violence. Non-violence is a completely new grammar of it. You know, that, 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 that's something one has to say. Yeah, this is very, very... Uh, 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 it was very interesting to listen to the paper, which, of course, uh, had been for a later for the in the magazine. Now, all this is uh, very, very interesting and useful as far as I can see. Uh, what you're actually perceiving is a kind of uh, uh, structural, logical account of democracy, particularly in relation to the question of people, citizen, uh, government, and so on. So all that is very clear. Right? And the difficulty is involved in it, and so on. And as Uday uh, rightly said, uh, one would like to see democracy as, a, as the unsurpassable kind of as This, of course, is that the kind of family, uh, uh, what uh, Saab said about communism, uh, communism as the uns unsurpassable horizon of our times. But uh, certainly, we, communism has been redefined in various ways uh, in terms of community. Uh, mm, uh, uh, un uh, evolvable community and so on, inoperative community and not see and so on. Similarly, uh, Derrida would speak of democracy in terms of democracy to come. In terms uh, democracy, democracy to, to come. come. Yeah. Uh, it is to say ever surpassing of democracy and uh, it will certainly unsurpassed in mm -hmm. one sense, but in another sense it is going to be uh, ever surpass, surpassing kind of uh, uh, process and condition. I think that both things mean the same. No? Both expressions ultimately mean the same. And and, uh, and, and uh, ever, you know, ever to be surpassed. Kind of. uh, I'm not sure, not that. Because uh, it's a kind of... There is some yeah. sense of something that is receding from you. Rather, not receding, but overcoming itself. Uh, anyway, yeah. every time, all the time. So that into an infinite horizon. That's probably how it could be, could be understood. But on the other hand, apart from the structural and logical kind of question, uh, I want to see how one can look at the historical issues here. Yeah. It's, it's, that's what is uh, uh, could be very, very, you know, which can contribute a lot of um, uh, interesting dimensions here. Yeah. Now, one has to see, well, I mean, if one, see, uh, one looks at the emergence of democracy in the Western countries. Uh, let's say 18th century, something like that, we are here. Uh, it's in, in a particular economic, political, economic context. Uh, I'm saying this without much of knowledge of political uh, theory as such, but from what I really understand. And uh, there's an emergence of a certain class in a major way, a bourgeoisie which, demand, which is demanding these things. And it is also making reference to the Greek context. So they are inventing something called democracy from the Greeks, which they consider as their ancestors and as their kind of uh, intellectual content head and so on. And uh, so that uh, development goes on. And, uh, in, and Indians, in, in India, we in the 19th century, we become accustomed to these ideas of democracy, politics and so on. And uh, into 20th century, when, we, when India is independent, there are attempts to, um, there, there are two things one should mention here. One is the uh, kind of uh, division of India, particularly uh, into a society which is dominated mainly by the Muslims and a society which is got predominantly Hindu population. And uh, 
um, uh, uh, and in so that itself induces a kind of difficulty in in forming a kind of unity of the people in, uh, for for a democratic kind of projects uh, 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 or a democratic movement, and uh, uh, and then uh, and, and a lot of things would have followed from that kind of revolution uh, uh, and the need to kind of prepare the, uh, prepare the, kind of the particular uh, configuration of uh, hierarchical divisions and horizontal divisions among religions, hierarchical divisions among castes and so on. Uh, and uh, there would have been great difficulty in forming those professions and so on. All these, of course, in a way they are implicit in what you are saying, uh, but you know, one might like to address them more directly. You see, for what happened? Now, I, I want to say one more thing here. Uh, it is uh, it may be useful to um, ask this question here, since we are concerned with the, uh, with democracy in a general sense, and not only in the context of India. Uh, what? Why? Why does democracy uh, find it difficult to take roots in Islamic society? And, uh, and then one has to compare that difficulty with the difficulty in India. With the difficulty? In India. They are not completely incompatible. <coughs> right. Because it's total resistance to except in probably Tunisia or something like that, or Egypt and Egypt to some extent. They attempt these things, they fall down, they break down and so on. You know, in various ways, for various reasons and so on. Now, in, we can keep comparing Indian democratic situation with Western societies on one hand, and at the same time we try to compare it with Islamic societies. So India is falls somewhere in between. India is certainly not aligned with West in this respect. India is fragile, democratic structures are so fragile, um, but not non existent or, or something that can be dismissed off as an Islamic society. So we, uh, in, in, in a way, try to repress that problem. Or, of course, what probably happened in communist societies. And once we started talking about uh, democracy now, we sort of leave communism behind. Uh, why and how they try to keep democracy out of their system. So uh, there would be all these different uh, points of orientation. The so-called um, assumed the success of democracy, which is not a full success in some of the Western societies. And, and whereas those who follow Western <coughs> uh, models in Latin America, they just sort of see the two dictatorships. Uh, and uh, you know, so that's one, Western European <coughs> influence and so on. And second is Islamic societies. And third is communists, well, even now in China. And fourth is the Indian kind of context where there is wobbling, uh, fragile kind of struggles going on. Uh, they attempt to, I mean, it's almost like a, the Sisyphus kind of situation. We take it forward and it, it's a very easy to come down and we are on the verge of collapse, you know, Indian democracy today, you know. Uh, because we might go towards um, dictatorships or towards some other form of authoritarian society and so on. That's all, we are on the verge of that problem. So I'm allowed to, I mean, apart from the question of poverty, which is very visible. Uh, yeah, I mean, I get, and they're immensely uh, important and complex questions. I might not be able to do justice just often like this. But you see, to come to the main thrust of your question, that uh, Western modular is a way our practice here. If that, that's what we are drawing at. Historically. Uh, historically, yes. That's what we are drawing at. I would say, you know, like the concept of, you know, <coughs> say right from the birth of Western uh, democracy, if you take the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen as the point of birth, you see, uh, uh, a lot has been discussed about man and citizen, this two terms and their relations, the fraught nature of their relations, the rights of man which is supposed to be universal and actually igniting the rights of citizen has been called the rights of the rightness and all that kind of rights of the bare body. But at the same time, you know, it is important, it is good 
that the evocation of that man, universal man, remains there because you can keep sort of appealing to, to it for many different purposes, for many different contexts, the contests. Similarly here, yes, what our democracy has to be a product of our history. And mind you, this discourse of Western democracy is part of our history. It's not just alien, it's very much part of our history. It's something that the leaders of this country toiled on. Okay, fine. But anyway, th there are other things which are not present in uh, Europe. So obviously, it's true with our history. But nonetheless, you know, this idea of citizen, this idea of equality, this idea of representation, you know, mere evocation of these ideas gives the discursive, you know, allows the discursive matrix a certain dynamism, a certain direction. That's about all I would say. And the relation between our historical difference with those modular you know, structures will never be resolved. It cannot be, because that's part of our historical complexity itself. Okay? Islamic societies. Islamic societies, yes, they would be, well, that's another huge discussion, but as I was talking this morning only, the way, you know, I can refer back to Talal Asad. And the way he sort of demarcated or differentiated uh, liberal secularism in the West vis-a-vis -vis Islam and why he is saying that it is impossible for a Muslim to, to live like a Muslim in the Western context because he says the paradigms are very different. Like here in the Islamic context, he say, says that the kind of religion we practice is you know, tradition is guided by tradition, the guided reason. You know, it is not the autonomous subject practicing universalizable maxims. It is rather belonging to a moral sphere which is subscribed by many others and all bound by God that is a moral. <coughs> so it is a different kind of uh, grammar altogether, universe altogether. Now, that kind of purist argument at some point cracks. Because when you find that there are a lot of Islamic people in the Western context or in our country or many other countries who would be, would be practicing the Islamic codes, wearing you know, hijab, you know, having time for namaz, but at the same time defending their religious beliefs in the perfect language of Western individualism and rights. And that to me, that fuzziness to me, is what makes it you know, real. Not that, you know, example, beautified example that Talal Asad is given. And for such people, why cannot there be a democratic setup is something that I don't know. So I think in response to what you are asking about Islamic society, I have not read Talal Asad, I don't know if what he has been saying, but uh, if you look at the early history of the, uh, I would say, after Muhammad, he did not reveal that he has a successor to him. After him, okay, so these four caliphs have been known as the Rafiul caliphs. The Rafiul caliphs, as we know, they were not uh, appointed by Muhammad after his death. They were chosen by the Arab people after he died and they elected him. The point is that of these four caliphs, the second and the third, they were both killed by their own people. In the instruction, the fourth was Ali, who is obviously the leader of the Shia, as we know right now. So, what I am trying to say is that sovereignty itself was never something that was given. To Islamic societies. There was no such thing as sovereignty is delegated to uh, Abu Bakr or Osman or Ali after Muhammad died. Mm -hmm. And this problem of sovereignty is something that persists even later on in Islamic societies through the Abbasids or the Umayyads. They could never ever come to an agreement of who would be sovereign. That is also, you can see that in the law of primogeniture, which is not followed by the Islamic kings, or the Mughals or not. So I was thinking of it in this way that the sovereignty is not really part and parcel of Islamic law. Maybe that is why it's also not happening right like now. Are you sure? Yes. Uh, yeah, there is a question there. Yes, sir. I just want to add some names. I just want to add some names. The way the public and the public are saying, very society is going back to democracy. Going back to the? Back to democracy. What of course democracy have? Whatever close democracy is having, the society is again going back to the 
Yes, yes, yes. Gracias a veces ha sido porque necesitamos hacer ese error. Yo, en favor de democracy is used for some other purpose. So this tussle, you know, this kind of uh, chemistry will keep going on and no one can remain untainted by democracy. That's, that's, a, that's a triumph of democracy and therefore they say that it's the unsurpassable horizon. It gradually becomes like that. In spite of, Ransom was pointing out to the large differences of history, yes, but what that is making democracy even more interesting because we are having very complex kind of structures and compositions of democracy which is not prevalent in the West. And West itself, Western democratic pattern itself, A, there was large, major chunks of different difference among different you know, Western democratic countries. But now, with the arrival of people from the third world, in huge number, and with the new kind of geopolitics that's happening, Western democracy, the texture of it is also changing. You know? So that, that those are things, nothing is fixed as such. Yes. Then it was matched by exactly the causing of the two problems we are going to do today. It was a question of continuous wars in the country now for hundreds of years. So the very aspect by which uh, emissaries from the Gulf, and it's a very complex map yes. which stays there, yeah. because it's not Iraq and Iran, it's a whole you know, fanning out of what was then called Persia as a sort of uh, label for just everything that was represented. Those uh, relationships were mapped actually through visitors. And I think both these questions when put together explain the history of the coastal region. Because yes. the wars were so huge and they were so continuous and they used to go on for hundreds of years. So it was not 40 years or 100 years, it was going for 300 or 400 years. So what we are seeing now is actually uh, historically placed in terms of reference points that you may find in footnotes. Yeah, I also think it's very interesting. I think collapse of democracy. Right? <laughs> I was just saying that uh, the collapse of democracy uh, towards the traditions is far more interesting than the anxiety to build up democracy. Uh, whether it is Spain or Germany and in the United States in a global way yeah. and so on. Yeah, that's followed. I mean, you see, I mean, let's uh, for that if there's a simple answer. Mm -hmm. it's, it's collapse of democracy is constitutive of democracy. That's not fair. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying explaining to you because after all, democracy, the way the kind of democracy you're talking of, mm -hmm. is part of the liberal package. It's the part of the liberal contract. And if you now think of it, that liberalism is premised on the illiberal is premised on the kind of that it it will it might dissolve any moment. The phrase that you know Hobbes used, Tancom dissolute. Any moment this tranquility can dissolve. So what you do, you be in constant vigil against whatever is illiberal. 
And that's the history of, you know, that's the history of imperialism. That's the history of enlightenment in a certain way. What does even as otherwise benign essay like perpetual peace tells you? It tells you that this is a club of republican nations, you know, which is within history. But beyond that is this vast, beyond that there is one more belt, which is not republican as such, but part of civilized world. So if it is not you know, republican, it will become republican. So it's a matter of time, it's a temporal question. And outside that is sheer vastness where repertiousness holds. And that is tenuously poised between the anthropological and the historical. So, you know, that anxiety is what constitutes liberalism, by which I'm not saying all the liberal protocols, all the liberal manners, all the liberal ways of doing things is just that. No. But at the constitutive level, it is premised by that illiberal, advent of illiberal. Therefore, democracies can very easily you know, swing to the other end, as it happened in America after 9-11, you know, for a certain section of people, I'm not saying for everyone. Anyone? Well, just two, two thoughts. Mike. Yes, Mike. One is... I can hear a look. You can hear One is, uh, if the critique of democracy requires democracy as the address... As the address. As the address. Uh, how would you, and this was coming at the end of the second section, I think, but the third section spoke of durability and the episodic nature of it. So how would you, uh, and I'm just trying to understand this a little better, uh, understand durability, the relationship between durability and, and, and episodic. Yeah. If the critique requires democracy itself yes. as, as the one in the yeah, the, 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 the durability is precisely because democracy is framed as a critique of itself. Therefore, you know, Rosavella says that it is always, already, you know, self-defined as an experiment. So it can always say that I failed this time, but, you know, give me one more turn. And this is very much like, you see, democracy and you should also compare it with capital. You know, both are ever extending great. This is precisely what capital will tell you all the time. So because it is framed as an experiment, it cannot be easily thrown away with. And it can also adjust to different historical situations. With respect to that, I have a point. Yes. Uh, I think that the, uh, the charged ending that you gave to the paper, living dead. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a very charged metaphor, uh, the living dead. Uh, one question would come to us that can we understand democracy as you know, quasi successful in the West, uh, middle level success in India and some Southeast Asian countries, and then what are called Middle East etc. not so successful. Uh, would it not be a question of uh, two, two angles? One is if I really want, want to understand democracy and if suggested it in one, one part of the paper, would I not have to understand it in terms of its relation with capital and the model? So in that sense, uh, this uh, classification that is there in the West, not there in the Middle East, but somewhat there in the Southeast, um, would require a more complicated yes, analysis I think, yeah, in capital. I think, I mean, this is also what I wanted to tell Francel. Yes, there are different histories, you know, behind all this. But there is now increasingly a global, you know, state. Like, you cannot, I cannot say anymore that democracy from this to this time now in America has been successful and it is not working here. Yeah, for well, one thing at least, there is a, some kind of new global demography being formed. You know, if it is surplus humanity, 
in say Jakarta, Calcutta and Mumbai in a certain sense it's affecting, not only affecting the West, in their own domain it's happening all the time or at least the discourse of it is affecting their political lives. So that has to be taken into account and so we have now two different notions. One is the modular democratic, you know, management of people and the new emerging demographies thanks to the neoliberal technologies and also the increase of all this population as such. So I think these are all these are all becoming new challenges and more com and the new kind of complex that we need. And in it should also depend on how these societies would manage their living It's not that the living there would be a feature of yeah. Rani Ganja, coal yeah. mines, no. or gangs or was No, no, no. Uh, the American prisons or maybe black yeah. shanty towns would also have yeah. uh, princes which are animals. Yeah. So it's also a question how each one is. You see, I mean, more and more, like as it, as you, if you see uh, our five year plans, you know, we grew up. I mean, more than you, Susan and I in this hall and France, we grew up hearing in the you know, uh, transistor set, the news being read that India is performing in a very good manner this year in the five-year plan. So much and so much growth has been achieved in these this, this sectors. But that growth kept on being achieved and people kept on being poor. But nonetheless, even for the planners and the politicians, cut out that portion of rhetoric, there was some kind of flickering hope that maybe the people released from the villages will have some kind of gainful employment, if not now, at a later point, you know, in, in the nation's future. But that hope is receded. That has completely receded. Similarly, I think in population management terms also, we don't have a policy anymore. It's ad hocism. Ad hocism, and therefore I gave the example of Lal Mohan Tudu. He is killed, his daughter is taken to the school. You know, so when you have this surplus humanity, you know, it's, you know, when under the light, you give, you know, care, outside, you just kill. Uh, can I? Yeah, yeah. yeah please. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, I was just thinking, I mean, this is all related, of course. Uh, it's all right. Uh, uh, yeah. I was okay. yeah. Are you thinking of, uh, Elections, basically a single election, the different elections that you mentioned. For instance, uh, earlier the Bengal election when uh, Mamata Banerjee comes to power, then uh, after some time, let's say the BJP winning power at the center and the AAP winning. Now, I was thinking, I was wondering, listening to you, uh, whether it's possible to think of electoral participation, people participating in elections, uh, meaning basically voting can be seen as uh, uh, something like counter politics or counter power. Instead of be, it being seen as part of the electoral power, which is the kind of main logic of uh, legitimate democracy, uh, uh, the aim of elections being to elect people who will take decisions of government, instead of looking at it only in that light, look at election also as exercises in something like what you're calling after Rosavala, something like counter power, uh, which can mean what? So for instance, we take the different examples. Of course, in the Bengal elections, what happened was there was a kind of historical rupture because CPM was in government for so long. And at the same time, there was a very strong, immediate political movement, which was the Shingur Nandigra movement. Taken together, it has a kind of classic people's Absolutely. Uh, 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 kind of, you know, ruptural expression through the election. That's one paradigm. But compare that to, let's say, the BJP winning this time. Now, if you look at the way BJP won, a lot of the concepts that you're using towards the later part of your presentation become really very effective. Because that election is highly, highly managerial election. No? Mm -hmm. uh, it's managed through uh, the different agencies of the media, uh, advertising, projection of Modi in a particular light, taking Modi away from the earlier image he had after Godra, highly, highly managed. And of course a slogan at the center, which is a very abstract slogan which is developing, which is carrying on up to now. So the kind of interpretation of that election was, though they didn't get in absolute terms more than 31%, but still they got absolute majority. 
And more or less the, the interpretation has been that BJP won on the basis of something like a middle class or upper middle class, aspirational India. But think about it. Actually, a lot of the non-middle class, lower classes also voted for BJP. Yeah, a lot of them, of different profiles. Which really means that apart from the voting of a particular party, it also shows that the entire society, which is very heterogeneous, composed of very different groups and interests and, uh, and, and sections, voted in a sense as a people, in a formal sense of election, but also subjectively, meaning that there was a kind of, let me use the word, enthusiasm for BJP. Which is not simply the rich capitalist mob's enthusiasm. It's also, in a sense, an enthusiasm of the rich leading the poor. So, you know, it's, it's a kind of alliance of subjectivities. Which is not simply a, a cold-blooded decision to vote who is going to serve your interest, but it's also to give expression to a subjective possibility. So BJP stands for that subjective possibility on a, quite a mass scale, actually, at a certain moment. Which is not to explain by a classical class explanation, because different classes come together in a kind of subjective participation. Mm -hmm. Look at the art. I think the same logic can apply there, because unlike the CPM versus Trinamool classic juxtaposition of two antagonists, in BGP Congress was there, but Congress already was very highly delegitimized. In our BGP was a party, but BGP didn't stand in that sort of a opposition to AP. It was more like that a different kind of configuration of forces this time, where the urban poor were leading the rich. So a lot of rich people, upper middle class, also voted for the army. But the subjective alignment seems to be that it is the urban poor, and you also spoke about that, which in the initial moments at least participated in the AAP uh, campaign, and the auto drivers in Delhi for instance. They are a tremendous force in uh, making the AAP into, they, they call themselves the, uh, the, the, the electoral managers of Urban Kejriwal, because they would have these slogans for Urban Kejriwal every autumn. Now, this seems to be very interesting where something like election is not only the exercise of the power to elect the decision makers, it's also a kind of subjective participation, which counter power is. Counter power is also a kind of expression of distrust. So election, can election also be an expression of distrust and enthusiasm at the same time, which is not explained in terms of two parties opposed to each other, but different classes, in other situations antagonistic, actually acting in a kind of configuration. But they are already equivalent. One, one section of society leads them. So the rich can lead the poor, or the poor can also lead the rich. And the urban poor in that sense in the art question become very interesting, because here the urban poor express a state which is not clearly that of political society. But at the same time, it's not only that of the classic case of interest group. It's neither a pure interest group, nor is it a political society. It is something else. It, in a sense, becomes a kind of vanguard of the, of the electoral people, a kind of enthusiasm, as I'm calling it. So I was thinking, is it possible to look at electoral elections not just as instruments of democratic decision-making, but also as subjective exercises of something like counterpart? Now, the advantage of doing this is you can join elections in a country like India, where elections are very effective. They are very regular. They are very meaningful. With other societies where elections are not so meaningful in terms of instrumentality. Mm -hmm. So, so Pakistan, for instance. Major elections happen. We still say, a lot of people at least say, that the power is exercised by many other agencies. But in terms of participation, you have a tremendous amount of actual participation even there. Or in Egypt, the different elections that have happened which have led to confusion. But the election as an act of the people, the thing that you're investigating, can it be seen as a kind of electoral but not democratic power in the instrumental sense, but, but as kind of counter power? That was what I would say. I mean, I think absolutely. I agree with you. And But what I will say is this aspect, election as subjective kind of expression, as a kind of people's subjective uprising or, you know, like that. Uh, was always there uh, in independent India 
from my childhood memories growing up in a refugee colony amidst other poor people, I used to find on the day of election, day, was, day of election was like a festivity. When our you know, uh, sisters, elder sisters, we used to see them taking out a sari from you know, whatever, the almira and you know, sort of putting the bindi and you know, then all of them going together. It's a kind of, you know, uh, that kind of, for a poor country like us, and I think in other poor countries also, there is this affect thing attached to it. It means more than that instrumentality. That I'll put the vote, you'll put the, if three of us do, this, this person wins. Mostly, mostly, mind you, sorry, most, mostly, you know, people during our, you know, say, in the 60s or 70s, in most homes, it's the father who is to decide whom to vote for. That part was decided, not that there was many, much individualism about it, but the fact that they're going to vote and it is family's vote that mattered a lot. Now, see, for your question, I see that in election, one can see three. One is what the thing you say about Modi's coming, the kind of rhetorics that went, about up and about Mamta's coming to power, you have showed the differences. Now let's see whether there is something common in it. The common is, I think, the emergence of something called the post-colonial neoliberal imagination, centered on the city, eh, which directly fitted with Modi's kind of agenda, but it did wake up also in a very interesting manner. It did at the level of that kind of rhetorics of neoliberal city, at the level of the civic. Therefore, it was a kind of, I think, civic uprising. And instead of saying, as you were saying, that it's the poor who led the rich, I don't think it was happening like that. I don't think it's the new imagination of a looked after civic, okay? which is rid of corruption and all that kind of utopia, that became the you know, clarion call to a large extent. You know? And they had, of course, the poor and the rich had, of course, their own specific reasons for voting the up. But the uniting point was this. The other thing that is happening as, that comes out from what you said is the kind of redundance of class logic. But, you know, before we jump into that conclusion, let us take, you know, a step back and see whether the class logic is actually becoming redundant or it is a symptom of present kind of pessimism that has come up. You know, like, as I said at one point in the paper, that the, in, in Bengal economy is, you know, nose diving, no jobs, as you know, you live there. Nothing. And out of this cynicism, Mamta could have addressed this and you know could have tried to resolve it, but she found that's a huge effort and the if, you know and the results are answered. Instead, if even more factories going to lock up and all that, there'll be an internecine battle happening and with small gratis here and there, something could be manipulated. Though everyone will say it cannot happen for long. But this is what was happening there, this is what is still happening, you know. And this wholesale rejection of CPIM, there are many reasons for it, but one is also the rejection of the...